Hello everyone. Um, I'm Marty Witter. I'm the fire ecologist at the San Monica Mountains National Recreation Area. Um, another role that I have is I work with John Keeley um, as sort of the organizing uh, team of the Southern and Central California region of the California Fire Science Consortium. And we've probably been up and running for about um, five years now. And this is really a national effort that has been made by the um, Joint Fire Science uh, Program, which is a federal uh, program to um, uh, fund and support uh, fire science, and then also uh, to see the, the results of those uh, studies get out into the real world and uh, have a real um, impact on how fire is managed throughout the country. So California is one of the sub-regions of this, um, we call it the Fire Knowledge uh, Exchange Program. And then within California, we have uh, five different regions. So um, we are representing Central and Southern California. So a lot of the work that we've done is we take the results of fire science that we think are of um, have important management implications, and we try to uh, get that information out to uh, land managers, conservationists, fire safety councils, and we do that in a whole number of ways. Um, there are webinars. We have spent a lot of time uh, developing what we call fire science briefs, so it's taking research papers and condensing them down into um, one or two page summaries and then identifying what the management uh, implications are. So it's basically trying to get uh, fire science information out to as broad a range of people who uh, are interested in different aspects of fire management. And if you go outside, um, we have some examples of those briefs, some of the ones that are probably most relevant to this area. Um, and I've also got a sign-up sheet out there. So if everybody could sign in, it would just help us uh, keep track of this. So um, one of our latest efforts is to um, uh, more directly reach people who are interested in some aspect of uh, uh, fire management uh, and fire planning. So, one of the things that uh, we've focused on a great deal is um, how to minimize the impacts of um, fire mitigation, things like fuel breaks and defensible space, um, to uh, uh, protect communities and homes. And the clear, we have very clear evidence that the way to do that is to uh, work from the house out in. Um, Creating, creating that uh, defensible space. So this workshop was put together because we wanted to um, come to be experts <laughs> at um, uh, uh, making people aware of the, na the nature of our uh, native flora, uh, the value it has, um, and how you can use that in um, uh, working with uh, fire safety landscaping. And John will be giving uh, the first talk that's sort of going to give you the um, setting that we uh, are living here in Southern California, uh, talk about our fire regime and what um, actions you can take to be um, fire safe. So Kitty is our host for this wonderful workshop today. Thank you, Marty. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm really happy to see you here. and. John's not going to like it again, but I'm really sorry that we are having this series, that we've had to pay so much attention to fire in the state. But I think it's something we all need to learn a lot more about. Um, going forward, it's going to be, sadly, like probably a more regular part of our day-to-day uh, -day experience here on the urban wildland fringe than we would ever like. Um, but one of the things that, one of the positive things, there's a number of positive things actually that have come out of our La Tuna fire experience, and one is we've been able to uh, be of more service to our neighbors, which I really appreciate, that we've been able to supply some information that's in addition to what you can do in your yard, but uh, how you can live safely 
uh, adjacent to wildlands. Another is coming, uh, learning about the Fire Science Consortium, which uh, is an amazing organization of people who are incredible experts um, that just another public service that I think we should all be very grateful is supplied by the state and federal government. Federal government? It's federally funded. Federal. Federally funded. Your tax dollars at work. I love it when your tax dollars go to things that you actually, you know, can I clearly identify and he's like, that's a good value. <laughs> I do appreciate that. Um, so we have a full day planned for you today with a lot of excellent speakers. I'm going to, I want to thank Marty and for helping to organize this and Lily Singer who's actually put a considerable amount of time into this. So I want to thank Lily Singer who is our Director of Adult Education and Special Projects. This particular project is both adult education and a special project, so she was able to bring all of her skills to bear. So uh, let's welcome Lily who's going to introduce the speakers. Thanks all for being here. So um, the morning's agenda, is, uh, the day's agenda is pretty tight. Um, we're going to operate on a 45 minute cycle with the speakers, um, but in between each there will be a little time for a stretch break. So um, not enough time to get down to the restrooms, but a stretch break. Um, so, um, the restrooms are located at the end of the headquarters building. They are new beautifully remodeled double spaced bathrooms, um, part of the beautiful graph that built this building and stuff. So um, they are down there. And um, we'll have, if you have your schedule, so we'll have lunch at 12.30 and we're going to have lunch in the pergola, a new pergola up there. Um, so um, it is my honor to introduce the speakers, starting with you. So um, John Keeley is, Dr. John Keeley, what do we got about you? Research ecologist for the United States Geological Survey, co-author of Fire and Mediterranean Ecosystems, an expert on post-fire regeneration, also an expert on Manzanitas. Um, besides being a cool guy and very knowledgeable, John has published, what, more than 300 papers at this point? Um, so he does research and then synthesizes it, synth synthesizes it into written things so that that information can be disseminated and learned from, which is wonderful. Um, and we're really honored. He was our first speaker for the um, lecture series that we are having. Excuse me, I'm getting a note. Oh, I know. And uh, we are live streaming this. Um, <laughs> so, do note to the speakers, make sure that you speak loudly so that it can be heard. These are on a timer. Um, they surprise us once in a while. Where did you turn it off? I turned it off. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sometimes we can't get it to go on and somebody walks in the back door and they go on. So, it's, it's very, the, the mystery in the uh, lights. Anyway, um, so we're live streaming this. If anybody has a big problem with being in a video, stay out of the line of these cameras. That's the, um, and uh, we've had really good feedback live streaming these things and also putting them up on our website afterwards so people can get this information. And if you don't know already, and that's all I'm going to say, is uh, we're still having technical problems uploading John's talk, which was the first in the post-fire in the uh, Lactuna Canyon Regeneration Series. Eventually it will be up. But what is up is um, uh, Josh Link's program on sustain sustainable slopes. And he's a marvelous lecturer, and um, that is up on our YouTube channel. And you can link to it uh, from our website, I think, or from Facebook. Anywho, um, so without further ado, John's going to kick off this morning with his talk, um, giving you some background, and then we'll have a little break afterwards, and then come back from you, Melanie. Thank you, Lily. Thank you. Um, one thing I'll point out, feel free to interrupt me at any time. Uh, I taught for 20 years at Occidental College. I'm used to being interrupted. <laughs> now, the, the, uh, the, I assume most of you are uh, from Southern California, been here for a while, and so you'll recognize this scene in the background. I like to think of it as a rather typical autumn day in Southern California. <laughs> but what brings us uh, together oops, today is the Latuna Canyon fire. And uh, this uh, occurred in September in one of our largest fires that we've had in a very long time. What I want to do this uh, morning is, is put that fire in context to what you hear often in the media about fires, so you have an idea of how to understand this event relative to other fire events, uh, particularly in the western U.S., and then talk about the ecology of our landscape 
and how it responds to fires, and then end with a discussion of some of the critical short-term and long-term management implications of fires. Now, here's the uh, outline of the Latuna Canyon fire. Burned a good portion of the uh, Verdugo Mountains. Uh, and what's interesting is this has been a, uh, a really bad autumn for fires. And I'm sure all of you have been hearing about the Sonoma Napa County fires, which uh, occurred just north of San Francisco Bay. These are all uh, big fire events that uh, share some similarities with uh, the uh, Latuna Canyon fire in that they were juxtaposed near metropolitan areas of, of particular concern. Uh, but there are some things about these fires very different than Latuna Canyon fires and one thing you ought to be very thankful of and that is there was extraordinary destruction in the fires in Napa Sonoma County. Something like uh, I think the number is now 45 people have died from those fires. Uh, 7,000 structures were destroyed, uh, and they were substantially bigger fires on an order of, well over an order of magnitude more than our fires. And it might be uh, interesting to point out why these fires were so different than the Latuna Canyon fire. The Latuna Canyon fire occurred under an extreme heat wave, and winds were a factor, but we didn't have these extreme Santa Ana winds that during that fire. And, but that's what happened in the uh, North Bay area. They had these extreme winds. They don't call them Santa Ana's up there. They call them Diablo winds because they typically blow from Mount Diablo towards the coast. Or they sometimes call them north winds or uh, mono winds. But they blow from the interior out, as you can see by this smoke plume, and very high velocity winds with gusts over 70 miles per hour. And that was a big part of what happened in those fires. And the, the reason, though, these fires were so destructive has a lot to do with uh, demographic changes. This uh, outline here in red shows a fire that occurred in 1964 called the Hanley Fire, and it burned almost the, uh, the Santa Rosa is down here, burned almost the same uh, area as the recent Tubbs Fire, which killed uh, well over 20 people and, and destroyed 5,000 homes. Uh, these two fires overlap, but the 1964 fire, nobody died, and there were only 29 houses that were destroyed. Uh, both burned under these extreme winds. Now, what was the difference? Almost certainly it has a lot to do with demographic changes. Santa Rosa population has increased five-fold in the period from 1964 to the present. So that almost certainly is one of the things we always have to keep in mind when we talk about why were fires so destructive. Part of it has to do with uh, global changes in particular population growth. Now, let's put Southern California in the context of the state. And it's important to do that because the media often talks about fire in a very generic sense. They will talk about fire as though Everything they say applies throughout the state, but this is a very uh, large state. It has the largest latitudinal gradient of any state in the western U.S. And what happens in the northern part of the state is not the same as what happens in the southern part of the state. Uh, and there are a number of reasons for that. One is landscapes are very different, much of the north, and these uh, areas that are in color are U.S. Forest Service lands throughout the state. Uh, on U.S. Forest Service lands in the north, much of it is forested. Uh, in the south, much of it is covered with shrubland. So the landscapes are very different. Population density very different. About tenfold higher population density in the southern part of the state. And fires are much more common in this part of the state. Uh, about an order of magnitude more fires per year uh, than uh, in the south. And the proportion that are caused by people is much different. Just about all our fires are started by people, either directly or indirectly. So more people, more fires in the southern part of the uh, state. Now, one of the things that is of interest about that is the impact of the last century of fire management has been very different in the north versus the south. This uh, figure, published a few years ago by Forest Service employees, shows the departure in the last hundred years of fire frequency from what we believe was the historical frequency, the pre-Euro-American frequency. 
And blues indicate landscapes that have missed fires in the last hundred years. In other words, fire suppression has been highly affected in these forested landscapes, and they've had many fewer fires in the last hundred years than historically was the case. These uh, brighter colors here, yellows and oranges, indicate landscapes that have had way more fire in the last hundred years than we believe ever was the case historically. So we need to keep in mind, California represents two different fire regimes. We have the forests in the north, which uh, we've been highly successful at putting fires out. Uh, in the south, we've, not, we've been not so successful. Uh, and so we can define the north as having a deficit of fires in the last hundred years the southern part of the state, an excess of fires. And that plays in to the management, post-fire management, we'll talk about it a little bit later. Now, just to give an overview of what we know about these two different landscapes, in the northern part of the state, much of it is dominated by uh, forests, and fires historically burned in the understory. They didn't burn the forest down. They kept the fuels low in the understory, so generally fires didn't get into the crown or canopy uh, of the forest. Southern California, we've never had fires burn in the understory. Fires burn the entire canopy, so we have a very different fire regime. And when we look at the history of fires on these landscapes, the forests, uh, because they burn these low intensity surface fires, have uh, scarred trees, and here's a tree that's not uncommon in many of our western forests, and you see a scar there, that's from the surface fire burning it, and based on those scars, we can come up with a past record of fires in these forests, and here's a cross section through a tree that shows the outer scar here, and then these are previous scars laid down by other fires, and what we know from, the, uh, from these sorts of studies is that fires used to be very frequent in these forests. Uh, and this is illustrated by these horizontal lines. Each one represents a tree. The vertical hatch marks represent a tree fire star. And what we see, in, and here's the timeline here, up until about the mid-1800s, our forests, and this is true throughout the West, our forests had frequent fires every 20 to 30 years, and they would burn in the understory and uh, burn up the uh, fuels, and we know they were not high intensity fires because those trees persisted and laid down these fire scars. But what we also see is fire management has been really effective at excluding fires in the last hundred years. So fire suppression policy, which is what the state and federal government mostly practices on our landscapes, that suppression policy in these forests can be equated with fire exclusion. We've basically eliminated fires in our western forests. And one of the outcomes of this is that by eliminating fires for 100 years, the fuels have accumulated in the understory so that in this landscape here, it, you see a landscape, the entire landscape burned in this fire, which is about 10 years ago. Uh, the foreground here burned in what we think was a more natural uh, fire, a uh, low intensity surface fire that burned in the understory, maybe produced a few pockets of dead trees, but mostly the forest survived. The background shows what we think is an anomalous fire uh, regime due to fire exclusion, which has caused fuels to accumulate, and now we see forests with uh, crown fires and very different fire regime. So that's the story in that part of the world. In the Southern California, we have a very different fire regime. We have these shrublands. They burn in these high intensity crown fires. We don't have these fire scar records because we don't have trees and we don't have low intensity fires to scar anything. But we do have written records and going back to about 1910, we can document the amount of burning in Southern California counties. And what you see is nothing's really changed in the last hundred years. We've had as much fire every decade uh, since about 1910. And just to give you some idea of how much of the county this represents, uh, this, uh, each one of these bars, it's on a log scale, so it's not directly translated into area burn. But what it tells us is that about every decade, a third of Los Angeles County has burned in the last hundred years. Uh, and certainly we don't see any exclusion of fire in Southern California like we see in many of these western forests. So we've had a very different impact of fires. 
Now, let's talk about how this vegetation responds uh, to fires. Uh, and this is a landscape dominated by two different shrublands that are often called chaparral, which is the darker green vegetation, typically higher stature shrubs. And then the grayer shrubs are uh, coastal sage scrub, or older documents used to call this soft chaparral because the coastal sage shrubs have softer leaves. Uh, and you'll hear a lot more about individual species later on uh, today because several of our speakers are going to talk about some of these species and their value in terms of landscaping. But just to give you an overview of some of our shrubs, if you do much hiking around in Chaparral, you undoubtedly have come across this shrub here, chemise, uh, in the rose family. Probably the most ubiquitous Chaparral shrub in California. This green indicates distribution of chemise. It occurs throughout the Chaparral in most of California, but not all of California. For example, it's absent from a lot of the interior areas in the Sierras, primarily because it's sensitive to winter uh, temperatures. Uh, this shrub, Arctostaphylus, my favorite shrub, uh, has this beautiful red bark, these little curly uh, pieces coming off of it called manzanita. And manzanita uh, has these beautiful flowers. They come out in the winter, and winter is a time that most people uh, may not be out hiking around, so they miss the flowers, but in the summer they see these fruits, and the fruits where they obviously get their name, manzanita, because that's Spanish for little apple. And it, has anybody ever tried eating one of these? And they're not, you'll, you'll agree, they're not much like little apples at all. <laughs> they're very dry, there's almost nothing to them. And one of my favorite stories was a ranger once said that Indians in California, they could go for three days eating nothing but these manzanita berries. But they could also go four days eating nothing at all. <laughs> uh, another uh, common chaparral shrub, and it has a lot of similarities to arc to staphylus or manzanitas in that those two genera, manzanitas and ceanothus, are the two largest shrub genera in California. We have something on the order of 50 to 60 species in the state, and that's quite unlike all the other chaparral genera that we have. Most of them have just one or a few species. Uh, these two genera have speciated widely in, uh, in California, and they dominate chaparral throughout the state, but often there's a turnover of species. Some of them have these blue flowers. They're called uh, lilacs sometimes because they look superficially like the eastern lilacs. They're not at all related to eastern lilacs. Uh, others are sometimes called buckbrush, the ones that have white flowers, but used a lot in landscaping, and you'll hear more about that later today. Now, let's talk about what happens to these shrubs when they burn. Typically, the fires are really high-intensity fires, and it's not uncommon for the biomass to be burned all the way down to ground level in one of these fires. And it looks like a real disaster when you go out right after a fire and you see that essentially all the above ground biomass has been uh, destroyed. However, one of the things that is important to understand is chaparral is adapted to very high intensity fires. And so when you look at that landscape and you see what looks like a disaster, it's really not a problem for most of these species. And this is just an illustration with some data that we collected that shows uh, a measure of how severe the fire was versus things like the richness of species, the amount of woody cover, the total amount of cover. And basically what we see is relatively little effect of fire severity. In other words, you can have low severity fires or high severity fires, but generally they recover quite uh, well after fire. Now, this is what Chaparral, and hopefully this is what Latuna Canyon is going to look like next spring. We're going to see a lot of greening up very quickly, uh, and it comes about through a variety of mechanisms the plants on these landscapes have for being resilient to fires. Uh, and one of the uh, uh, characteristics that is common in uh, chemise is the production of the swelling at the base of the stem. It's called a basal burl or some people call it a lignotuber. And that burl is important because it houses buds 
uh, in the base of the burl that are capable of sending up new sprouts after the fire. And it's all timed by the fire because these buds are suppressed by a hormone in the plant called auxin. And auxin is produced in the tips of the plants, transferred down and suppresses those buds. Well, you burn the top of the plant off, the auxin's gone, and now they re-sprout. And so that's one of the ways these shrubs will recover after fire. And a lot of species will recover this way. This is uh, uh, sagebrush, artemisia, after fire, it re-sprouts from the base. Uh, here's encelia, also in this coastal sage vegetation. It actually re-sprouts from roots underground. So a lot of these plants are going to come back pretty quickly just by re-sprouting from parts of the original uh, parent plant. But in addition to that, most of our species produce seeds more or less on an annual basis, uh, and, but those seeds don't generally germinate uh, and they go in the soil and they remain dormant. And they can remain dormant for as much as a century and until a fire comes along. And here's what it'll look like uh, next spring in areas where there's chemise, lots and lots of chemise seedlings. Those seedlings are stimulated by the fire and they come back right after the fire. The same with uh, manzanitas. You'll see manzanita seedlings if there were parent manzanitas in the area. And the same with ceanothus. These seedlings are coming from a dormant seed bank that's been sitting there waiting for fire to come along. Without fire, they almost never will recruit successfully unless there's some other sort of disturbance uh, on the landscape. And this is just an illustration using data that we've collected that shows how closely timed the recruitment of new seedlings is to fire. These are different Ceanothus species after fire. And this is the percentage of Ceanothus seedlings that we observe in the first through the fifth years after fire. What you see is almost all the seedlings come up right in the first year. So this is a pulse of recruitment, comes from the fire, and in subsequent years, we have almost no seedlings at all. And it'll stay like that until the next fire. And so this is clearly a species that is not fire adapted, it's fire dependent. It has to have fire in order to regenerate. Uh, we also will have a lot of uh, perennial herbaceous plants, uh, which are often called geophytes because they have bulbs underground and those bulbs will uh, re-sprout after the fire. This is a plant formerly known as Zygodinus. I can't remember what the new name is for Zygodinus. Anybody know the new name? Gordon, just I'll buy that. It's in our program. Okay. Uh, they are in the chaparral in, without fire, but they generally persist as dormant uh, corms, uh, basically collections of leaves, underground. And very often they will not sprout uh, in the absence of fire, but you burn that landscape off and you can get massive recruitment of uh, these uh, zygodinas. Yeah. Common name for zygodinas? Um, Stars. Death And Starzine. What is it? Death I always call it Death So it's a, it's a lily. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so those are lilies. Those are lilies, okay. yes. Uh, and other uh, geophytes that you'll see, Mariposa lily here, um, which uh, is also a geophyte, and it persists as bulbs underground, and often it's dormant in the absence of fire, but once a fire comes through, those bulbs will send up new shoots. So all of these uh, species that are what we call herbaceous perennials, they're things that have underground parts that survive, they will come back after fire by sprouting, not from seeds. So their seeds are not going to be what produce these mariposa lilies that you see after fire. It's the re-sprouts. Um, and there are other um, uh, species that, are, that will come back from re-sprouting. For example, uh, larkspurs, common. There's several perennial larkspurs that will come back by re-sprouting after fire, but not from seeds. But there are a lot of things that do come back from seed. And uh, if we have a decent winter rainfall season, we likely will get a, uh, a plethora of uh, seedlings from annual plants 
native annual plants that have come up after fire. California poppy is one of the common ones, and there's a whole range of different uh, species. In fact, we have something like uh, 200 species in the state that are described as being restricted to post-fire conditions. And typically, they turn over, uh, in other words, the composition changes just from one slope to the next. So if you go out on a north-facing slope, you'll often see a different collection of uh, these post-fire annuals than if you go on a south-facing slope. So the composition will turn over from one slope to the next, and statewide there's probably about 200 of these species that are most frequent after fire. Now they have different levels of dependence on fire. Some own, you only find after fire, pretty much. These phacelias, for example, certain species of phacelia, you're only going to see them after fire. And then they will persist as dormant seeds until the next fire. And we know the seeds can live to be a century or more older in the soil. So they'll persist a long time until fire comes along. And here's another illustration of how closely restricted these species are to uh, post-fire conditions. This is the percentage of these for the first five years after fire. And you can see the vast majority of these are restricted to the first year or two uh, after fire. And the most restricted of all of these are species like Eminanthe or uh, Whispering Bells, uh, Papaver californicum, which is fire poppy, and a few of the phacelias, like this Phacelia brachyloba, very closely restricted to fire. And you almost never see them except right after uh, a fire. And for a long time, we've been very curious about what it was that triggered the germination to fire. Now, when I was a student, I was told that it was heat. The heat from the fire broke the seed coat and allowed the seeds to germinate. That's true for some species. In fact, that's generally true for things in the legume family, the Fabaceae. Species like Lupinus would be a good example. Um, and it's also true of things like Ceanothus. Uh, anything that has a seed that's very shiny, that is typically going to be a seed that is triggered by heat. But it turns out most of the things that come up after fire are not triggered by heat at all. And this is experimental work that I did over many years with students at Occidental where we uh, took species that came up after fire, collected their seeds, and these are six different species that we studied. And this is the percentage of germination after uh, the treatments we gave them. The first treatment is a control, meaning we didn't do anything but just water them and put them at room temperature. And what you can see is almost all of these have pretty dormant seeds. They just don't germinate uh, when you just water them. Then we also took some and we uh, exposed them to intense heat uh, at different uh, temperatures for like five minutes to simulate the heat of a fire. And then we applied uh, charred wood and uh, smoke, chemicals from combustion of the biomass. And what we found is for the vast majority of species after fire, they're not triggered to germinate by heat. They're triggered by chemicals from the smoke of the fire. And this is a highly specific cue to fire. Uh, heat, for example, is something that seeds can be exposed to without fire. If they happen to be in an open area, they often will receive enough heat to germinate. But combustion products from uh, a fire is something highly specific to fire. And this indicates that many of our species in Chaparral have a very close uh, evolutionary link to fire. And we've been tracing this link between fire and the life history of Chaparral shrubs. And I won't go into it in a lot of details, but just give you some perspective of how long fire has been on this landscape. This is a geological record here, uh, and the area, uh, the time period we're, era we're mostly interested in is called the Cenozoic, and the reason we're mostly interested in that is that's about the time most of the flowering plants started radiating on Earth. Um, and what we found is most of the genera in Chaparral have fossil records that go back uh, into 
the epoch known as the Eocene back 50 million years ago. So in other words, when you look at those shrubs out there in Chaparral, you have to respect the fact they've been around a long time. And when you look at the fossils of things like Cercocarpus, Fermentodendra, Garia, they look very much like contemporary uh, species in Chaparral. So that Chaparral has been around a very long period of time. They all are capable of recovering after fire through what we call re-sprouting. And we call these obligate re-sprouters because most of them don't produce seedlings after fire. They just come back from re-sprouting. But they've had a very long history with fire and they have developed the ability to re-sprout after a fire so they can persist in the face of fire. What we do find is, has been a change in the evolutionary record is with these two genera here, Archistaphylus and Ceanothus, the Manzanitas and the Ceanothus. Uh, they seem to have come along a little bit later and we can place their origin about 20 million years ago. And these are the genera that produce seeds after, or seedlings after fire. In other words, they are what we call uh, post-fire seeders and they generally only produce seedlings after a fire and we place their origin about 20 million years ago. What that uh, suggests to us is that fire on this landscape goes back at least 20 million years in terms of its uh, predictability to the point where species have actually adapted to this. So when we look at these fires, these are not anomalous events. These are events that have happened on this landscape long before people were even thought of. Now just let me summarize what we can say about the post-fire ecology and then I want to talk a little bit about management. The, um, we often talk about chaparral plants as being a fire adapted and in fact I used to tell my students chaparral is fire adapted. Now I feel like We've learned enough to know that we ought to uh, recall all those students and retrain <laughs> them because we now know it's a misnomer to say species are fire adapted. They are not adapted to fire per se, they're adapted to a very particular fire regime. And if you perturb the environment so that you change the regime, and by regime we mean the intensity of the fire, the frequency of the fire, uh, the uh, uh, patchiness of the fire, when you start changing those parts of the regime, you can have uh, impacts on species. And the way we would describe chaparral uh, fire regimes is certainly it's a high intensity fire regime. And in fact, we find if the fire is not very intense, it often will promote invasive species on those landscapes. So high intensity fire is really an important feature of the post-fire uh, ecology of these landscapes. They're also adapted to massive landscape burns. In other words, you can have a fire that covers 7,000 acres and the plants in the interior of that uh, perimeter will recover just as well as the ones on the periphery. They're adapted to these very large fires because they recover, What the way I describe it is they recover endogenously. They recover from either seeds that are already there in the system or from re-sprouts of plants that were already there. So they don't depend on colonization from the outside. If they did, then fire size would be really critically important. But it turns out it's not important in the recovery of chaparral. And then here's probably the most important part of post-fire ecology, and that is these species are adapted to fire intervals that are relatively long. 30 to 130 years. And that's really important because as we'll get to at the end of this talk, if you start reducing the uh, interval between fires, in other words, you increase the frequency of fires, it can have devastating impact on the recovery of our natural uh, systems. Question? Yeah? So it's the massive fire, it does a big or small fire, does it matter, does it, does it affect at all? The size of a small fire versus a larger fire? The size of the fire will not have any impact if all you're concerned about is plants. And I've left out any discussion of animals simply because I didn't know that I'd have enough time. But with animals, it's a different story. Fire size can be very important 
to the recovery of animal populations. In particular, because some of the animal populations, the only way they can deal with fire, is that fire alarm? It's Andrew's phone. <laughs> So, the, it's a very good question though. Is fire size important to the recovery of chaparral? If you're only talking about plants, which is what I'm talking about, no, it generally is of no relevance. Uh, and that's because chaparral species don't recolonize. If species have to recolonize by seeds blowing in, then size could have a big impact. But when it comes to animals, it's a different story. Some animals, the only way they can deal with fire is they have to flee and they flee to uh, unburned areas and then they have to recolonize. And in those cases, fire size has a big impact. Yeah? Is there any information on the intensity of the Virginia fire? On the what? On the intensity of it. Was it a high intense, was it a high fire intensity for Virginia I haven't seen any data out on that yet. Um, the first preliminary map I saw showed some areas were very intense and some weren't, but I don't really know much more than that. In general, you would expect the intensity is going to be related to the amount of biomass. So areas that were uh, with coastal sage scrub vegetation, probably lower fire intensities. Ones with chaparral likely to be much higher. Yeah? I assume fire suppression also results in long-term vegetation changes. The, um, the role of fire suppression is largely a function of what part of the landscape in California you're talking about. Now, when we looked at the forests in Northern California, you saw that gap after about 1850 in fires in forests. That's fire suppression impacts that has almost excluded fires. And we've been very successful at excluding fires in forests. Um, and part of the reason is, is the fires start out as low intensity surface fires and they're relatively easy to put out. They're not like our fires in Southern California. When they get started, you have to attack them immediately. I, I had this brought home to me when I first moved to Sequoia National Park where I'm stationed now. And the first summer I was there, a lightning storm came through and I had an email and it said there were 13 fires started in the park. Let's meet tomorrow to discuss how to deal with them. <laughs> You wouldn't have that response in Southern California. So in other words, in our western forests, particularly lightning ignited fires, they're relatively easy to deal with. And as a result, we've been very effective at excluding them. So fire suppression has had a big impact on altering vegetation in forests. In Southern California, we don't have areas where fire suppression has excluded fires. Uh, it's very rare to find an area in Southern California that's gone 50 years without a fire. And many of our areas, it's just the opposite. And if you remember back to that uh, diagram that showed the different colors in California, Southern California was colored yellow, and that indicates a landscape that has had more fire than historically was ever the case. And so fire suppression in this part of the world, it's been highly effective in reducing the frequencies of fires, but it certainly hasn't come anywhere close to excluding uh, fires like it has in forests. Okay, let's uh, go on to post-fire management and say a few things uh, about post-fire management. Um, two things that I think are particularly relevant is uh, short-term emergency responses and then longer-term management needs. And let me focus on the short-term because right after a fire, that's what captures people's attention. And in particular, if you have property that's at risk due to erosion. And if that's the case, active management is often advised. But the question is, uh, what type of management? Now, for a long time, We've uh, had a program in Southern California of seeding in with usually ryegrass in recent decades uh, after the fire as a way of stabilizing the slopes 
and reducing uh, erosion. But for a long time, and this is a paper that goes back uh, 20 years or more, there was a lot of question is, should we seed or should we not seed after a fire? And there's good reasons why uh, we might not want to seed on this landscape. And a lot of it has to do with what species that you seed in, like ryegrass, need in order to establish and provide protection. And that is, they need sort of a continuous rainfall during the autumn to first get them to germinate and let them establish before you have really intense storms later in the winter. If you look, though, at California uh, precipitation regimes, particularly Southern California, they don't look like that at all. You go out and you seed in with ryegrass, and they'll sit there for a month or two, and uh, typically what will happen is a Santa Ana wind will kick up, and it'll blow all the seeds off the slope, and sometimes they go back and they reseed. But when the rains come, usually we have intense storms right away. And so before the seeds have even had a chance to germinate and establish, uh, we're getting intense rainstorms where we do need something to stabilize the soil. And as a result, seeding has generally not been recommended, at least on most state and federal lands. Now, there are some communities that still will seed, uh, but by and large, it's not uh, been promoted. And part of the reason is because of the ecology of these landscapes. The species that are in, uh, indigenous to our landscapes are species that are adapted to recovering after fire. And this is a study I did a number of years ago in the Santa Monica Mountains where I looked after fire at the amount of exotic uh, uh, or amount of seeded species. And these were exotic uh, seeds and native seeds. And uh, compared the regeneration with just natural regeneration from annuals, herbaceous perennial shrubs, and subprotestant growth forms. And what we found is consistently the natural regeneration greatly outstripped anything that happened from the seeded species. So in other words, the seeding was, uh, in, certainly in this instance, was a complete waste of, of money. Now that doesn't mean seeding everywhere is a waste. Sometimes, for example, in the northern Pacific Northwest, they get rainfall patterns that might actually promote the germination of seeds early in the uh, fall, and there they might provide protection. But generally in Southern California, we just don't get the rainfall to uh, promote these seeded species, and our natural regeneration generally completely outstrips this. Now, there's another reason for not promoting seeding, and that is generally we seed with exotic species, and this is an illustration of what used to be used to seed after fire during the 1930s. The Forest Service would go out after a fire and they would aerially seed black mustard oh. onto burned areas. And they did this for many years until uh, farmers in uh, the valleys beneath these mountain ranges were complaining about all the black mustard coming up in their orchards because it was all being washed downhill. So the Forest Service stopped seeding with black mustard, but they haven't seen fit to go out and get rid of the black mustard. <laughs> so today, it is still a common part of our landscape. And it's also a fire-adapted species. After a fire, if there are black mustard seeds in the soil, they will come up uh, rapidly after a fire. And some people often think about, you know, this is a native because it's so integrated with our landscape. I remember after the Griffith Park fire, uh, I was on the radio show with a local supervisor. I can't remember, luckily I can't remember his name. It did have kind of a French sound to it. No, it wasn't him. Ellen, Ellen knows who, who I'm referring to. And he was talking about why we had to worry about uh, the post-fire conditions in uh, Griffith Park because there was all this native mustard coming up after the fire. And you can understand why someone might think that because it is so well adapted to these landscapes, but it is not a native species, it comes from Europe. Now, that the uh, short-term emergency risk, in general, going out and spreading seed is probably not going to be very effective in this part of the world. Now, that doesn't mean you don't do anything because there are things that can be done. For example, 
The things that seem to be most effective at reducing erosion are physical barriers that are placed out. So for example, there are these hay rolls that are sometimes used. Uh, and in forests, they often will cut down trees and use those to reduce erosion on slopes. Uh, sometimes there will be hay that is scattered across uh, the burned area, and that hay uh, basically uh, minimizes the impact of rainfall on the soil, reduces the amount of erosion. And then hydro seeding uh, along roadsides uh, is perhaps affecting, not so much because there are seeds in the mixture, but because it's a very tacky substance that does hold the soil. And along roadsides it might be justified, but it's certainly not something that I think most people would recommend as a way of restoring the ecosystem. It's really a way of producing a barrier. Yes, young lady. Who are you talking to? As the tachyfier breaks down and when the hay breaks down, does that change the nitrogen balance in the soil? Has anybody looked at the effects of that on the establishment? There, there's no question it has impacts. For example, the breaking down of the hay changes the carbon content of the soil, and that greatly affects a lot of processes in the soil. And there is evidence that it can inhibit uh, growth of some native species. Um, in fact, that's one of the, the problems in, in areas where the post-fire seeding of species, like in the Sierras, they often will use uh, wheat after a fire, and they'll seed with what they call sterile wheat wheat that can't regenerate, and so they think that's not going to have an impact on the environment. But we found that that wheat coming up the first year has huge negative impacts on the native flora coming back. And so what happens is they seed with the sterile wheat, the wheat comes up gangbusters, and then the next year the wheat's gone, but the natives have uh, a decline, and so it does have negative impacts that way. But yeah, these things can have impacts on the soil. The other impact is when you throw uh, hay out like this, there's almost certainly going to be alien species uh, in that uh, mix. And you also can spread um, alien species. Like I remember a study a number of years ago where we were talking about synthesizing the data on seeding. And one of the, the uh, statistics that came to mind was a, the seeding that was done after the um, was it the Arroyo Grande? What is the uh, fire around uh, in um, New Mexico? Um, uh, the one that Charisse was the... Uh, yeah, the Cerro Grande fire. Uh, there was an estimate that when they aerially seeded that with ryegrass, they also estimate that they deposited about a billion cheatgrass seeds <laughs> on that landscape. And so getting um, weed-free uh, material is a real challenge in a lot of instances. Now, the last thing I just want to touch on is uh, post-fire management in terms of long-term sustainable management. And this is important to keep in mind because when I look at a fire like the Latuna Canyon fire, 7,000 acres, I don't so much worry about the erosion, because I don't live at the bottom of those slopes. That's for other people to be concerned about. But what I'm concerned about is the long-term sustainability of the natural vegetation. And what that is dependent upon is fire managers keeping fire out of those landscapes for at least 20 years or more. Because if we get fires more frequently, than 20 years on that landscape. And that's a hard thing to do, 7,000 acres, and make sure nothing burns again in 20 years. Probably that won't happen. But what happens when you burn too frequently is you change the composition from native species to non-natives. And this is an area in San Diego County. Uh, all of this burned in 1970 in the Laguna uh, fire, the fire, incidentally, that got me motivated to study fires. And this entire landscape burned in 1970. In 2001, this portion of the scene burned in the Viejas fire. And then in 2003, this portion burned again by the Cedar fire. So there was only a couple year difference between uh, uh, the uh, previous fire and the Cedar fire. And what we saw is a dramatic change in vegetation. 
This is the native shrubling here, about 30 some years of age. This is recovering native shrubs uh, at about uh, five years of age in this scene. And then this is all invasive grasses. If you burn within a couple years after a fire, you could completely eliminate the natives and you get, in this case, red broom, which red brome grass that comes in. And it can be very pernicious, can stay, stay for a long time and inhibit further recovery. And this is a big problem on a lot of our landscapes. This is San Diego County. The green perimeter show you the 2003 fire. You may remember the big cedar fire here. Uh, 2007, we had another series of fires. Here's the Witch Creek fire. And what you see is about 27,000 acres of the uh, Cedar Creek fire burned uh, in 2007, so a four-year uh, separation. And in fact, over the entire county, we estimate that in 2007, about 60,000 acres were reburning the four-year-old vegetation from the 2003 fires. And that creates a real concern for type conversion from native shrublands to exotic grasslands. And this is an illustration of what you can get. This is an area in the Santa Monica Mountains, Topanga Canyon. Here is what Topanga Canyon looks like under a natural fire regime of maybe 30 to 50 year return intervals is all native shrubs. This is what happens if you take that same area and you burn it three times in 12 years. And what you get is the laurel leaf sumac persists because it's a vigorous re-sprouter, but all the rest you see are exotic grasses. And that's a major concern for a number of reasons. As a biologist, I'm concerned because we've changed our landscape from mostly native species to mostly non-native species. Uh, but as an ecologist, I'm also concerned because you've changed the landscape with deep-rooted shrubs to a landscape with very shallow-rooted grasses. And that changes the stability and the hydrology of that landscape and promotes um, repeat uh, or promotes erosion off those slopes. Thirdly, you change the fire regime. These landscapes here have a fire regime of about six months a year. They're vulnerable to fires. This landscape is vulnerable 12 months a year. So you've greatly increased the fire season. And then lastly, if you're concerned about uh, global climate change and carbon storage, you change the carbon storage dynamics on these landscapes. So there's a lot of reasons we might want to avoid doing this sort of thing. So this is the real challenge for the next 20 years, is keeping fire out of the Latuna Canyon uh, burned area. And I'll end it there. I'm happy to answer other questions. If you If you were doing a restore to the program, what would you recommend? If I was doing so, that. let's say they wanted to at, at least restore an area that had been burned by fire. What would you do to increase the native plants with the help of the law? Or what would be the recommended process? The recommended process by I think most ecologists familiar with chaparral and fire is to leave it alone. Passive restoration is the best 